Matthew's Gospel 28. Uh, now, last Wednesday, we began to look at the word sanctified common sense. Hallelujah. And I never got into the word sanctification anyway. But sanctified common sense. And, and I said to us that, you know, the prior weeks, uh, both on the Sunday services or in the Sunday services and in the Wednesday services, uh, we'll be learning on the leading of the Spirit, right? Come on. And so we continue there. And I added the importance of a sanctified common sense. Now, Matthew's Gospel 28 and verse 18 And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority, which is what power is given unto me in heaven and earth, go ye therefore and make disciples, that's what teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always until the end of the world or age. And he says, Amen. Now we said, This is the will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're looking for trouble, Go and pray for the will of God. This is the will of God for all believers. And this is what the will of God is for all believers. Now, of course, his immediate audience were the apostles or say the believers in the audience. Okay? But this relates to all believers. Now, two ways is going to affect you, relate with you directly. One, you are a believer of Jesus. You are also his disciple, and you are a believer in Jesus. That's the first thing. Secondly, is he asked them to go and make disciples. That's what I teach there. Matthew in the Greek, M-A-T-H-E-T-U-O. Okay? To go and make disciples. Now, disciples are those who are learning from the word mantano, M-A-N-T-H-A-N-O. Of course, we go to the Greek words uh, because of clarity in some instances. Now, in Matthew 11, where that word mantano, or the very art of discipleship, or to make disciples, is found in Matthew 11, 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and every laden, and I'll give you rest. Now, usually, you have people use this text in such a way, I'll say somewhere on Monday, that some of the ways we use the Bible text, even Jesus will be shocked. He's like, oh, you mean it? And he say, Lord Jesus, you said so, so, and so. And he says, really? Because <laughs> he's wondering where you got it from. Come unto me, all you that labor, and I have been laden, and I'll give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke, so he repeats the word yoke twice. Or repeats the word yoke, pardon me. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Now, notice the word yoke there before you get in there because it means that you're going to take a yoke upon him, upon you, sorry. And that yoke is to learn. Learn of me. 29, mantano, to learn of me. Now, of course, uh, if you are in the African churches, you know that you must have heard this text in different kinds of meetings, deliverance services, um, yoke breaking services. What else do we have? Generational curses or, or greater powers. Whatever, like, you know. And it says, are you weary? But now the thing is, this text is from 25. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and you have revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good, in thy sight. Let's take 27 together. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any one man the Father save the Son, and to whomever the Son will reveal him. Now, so he's talking about revelation, right? Come on. To disclose information about the Father and the Son. He says, You know the Father, how? In the Son. You know the Son? In the Father. Is that making sense? Come on, is that making sense? So when it says, come unto me, what does that mean in context? To come and know who? 
the Father. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Now, of course, maybe in a sense that translation was correct. Uh, maybe religion would mean um, having a form of godliness, but really having no knowledge of God. Maybe they're right in that instance. But the word religion can be used wrongly. Religion is not anti-faith. Okay? Religion doesn't mean it's not of God. You know, it's just being religious. It could be correctly said and wrongly said. That's by the way. Take my yoke upon you, which is the word zugos, Z-U-G-O-S in the Greek. Uh, zugos usually creates a balance between two different objects or persons. So it brings a balance. It's the use of balance. Not all the time, but that's what the word zugos means. You have, um, one minute is the text I'm looking for. Um, wait, 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 wait. Anyway, it's to have a balance. I think I'm getting it right now. One minute. Uh, the text in Revelation I'm looking for. Okay, to give a balance. Also, it's used to tie a student with a learner. So in, it's used for learning. Now look at uh, Acts 15.10. Acts 15.10, the context was, the, com the, the issue was uh, whether the Gentile converts could also be circumcised. Acts 15, and that's the context of that, could be circumcised. Verse 5, right? Some said they could, to keep the law of Moses, and um, circumcised and keep the So you have verse 6, the apostles and elders came together because of this matter. So Peter now spoke in verse 10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples with neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, which is knowledge to learn and follow. The yoke cannot be circumcision. Circumcision is not a yoke because oftentimes when you're circumcised, right, you don't carry a yoke. You don't even know. You didn't know when it happened. And even if you had to do it in an older or advanced age, it's not a yoke. It just happens once you feel the pain, you move. But here, zugos means to tie you to learn something and practice it. So that's the word yoke. To learn and practice. Then we have Galatians 5.1. Stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage or the learning of bondage or to be tied to learn bondage. Galatians 5.1. Then you have 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verse 1. Now this says, As many servants as are under the yoke, count your masters worthy of all honor, and the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Okay, so that's the yoke, right? Where you are under a master. So now master is also a word used for teachers. So that means yoke is what ties a student to who? A teacher. So they take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I'm lowly, a meek in heart, lowly in spirit, a meek and gentle. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, which is the learning of the father. So when we talk about making disciples of all nations in Matthew 28 and 19, we're referring to a yoke of learning. A yoke of learning. Now I said this earlier before I got in there that the will of God for all believers is Matthew 28. And I, I, I was going uh, elsewhere. Sorry, let me, sorry. I was going elsewhere 
So I got my notes here, so I'll probably just use the notes I have scribbled somewhere. So I was going elsewhere to say that if we are learning from the disciples or the apostles, then what did we learn from them? We become their disciples. So why do we have a yoke? Is so that we can balance out and learn what they are doing and follow them. If you're a disciple of a doctor, you become a doctor. If you're a disciple of a lawyer, you become a lawyer. If you're a disciple of a teacher, you become a teacher. If you're a disciple of a missionary, of which these 12 and precisely the 70 or 120 are, you, this is the end product of the yoke. Is that clear? Come on, guys, is that clear? That's what it's about. So I don't need to ask what's the will of God for my life. That's a very foolish question. If I have the written word, I have God's will for my life. And that's why Paul, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, says do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The word heterozygous. Now heteros simply means another sort or a different sort. So a different yoke. Now, what's a different yoke? Because there are two things that shouldn't be yoked together, the unbeliever and the believer. And, and at the series we had, we finished on Sunday, uh, just before you say, I do, when you are done, and what are you doing? And we said in there that from Genesis through to the epistles, God forbade or had to forbid people from marrying, marrying certain people. And, I, and I've, I've had people say that's, that's ethnicity or let's say ethnic bigotry and stuff like that. And they say, well, it's racism and all that. I remember I was in a class in a university and my lecturer actually alluded to that. The God discriminated against women and in the Old Testament that now we're under grace, uh, you know, those things have gone. But the fact is that the Old Testament was scripture against women. And I said, no, man, you're wrong. <laughs> and she was like, eh, I said, you're very wrong. And I went into the facts that it wasn't discrimination against Canaanites. That after all, in, we, we saw a Canaanite king whose name was Melchizedek. Genesis 14, who blessed Abraham. So it wasn't a question of being against any ethnic group. I said, no. And so we went to all the texts we saw on Sunday, and we the reason was they would make the Jews or the man from Israel to worship other gods, that the issue was worship. And they know it was worship. It was because, and we saw the fulfillment. We, we saw it, right? Come on. So, well, a typical one was Solomon, right? King Solomon, Bible teacher, prophet, a great man of God. And you see the import of influence. So, the point is, and critically so, that when it says heterozygous, it means you folks are not together. You cannot learn Christ from a non believer, you can't learn the worship of Christ from darkness. That's what he's saying. Heterozygous. But you can learn other things from a non-believer. Amen? Don't say, well, I, if I get to a school and the lecturer is not a Christian, I'm going to walk out of that class. Do not be unequally yoked. All right? I'm going to walk out of the world eventually. Okay, so that's why you have to make disciples. We learn by a yoke. So we are tied to learning. We're tied to know. And that's the mandate of God upon the church, upon all of us. So if we're learning from the apostles, we have their yoke, amen, on us to learn from them. Mark 16, 15, we were there last week. Go into all the world, we're going to go back there shortly, and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And this sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons as were devils. And shall speak with new tongues. If they drink any death, they shall not hurt them. They shall uh, lay hands on the sick. They shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick they shall recover. Then it says in 19, so then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was lifted up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. 
And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them, their eyes, eyes, and confirming the word with signs following. With signs following. Which means this is God's will for every believer to preach the gospel. They don't say, well, I don't know how to preach the gospel. That's a lie. You know how to invite people for occasions. I've never heard anybody say, I don't know how to invite people for my birthday. They know how to do it. I don't know how to tell people about an occasion. They go ahead and do that. But say, the gospel, how do I start? How did you start? You don't know how to preach the gospel to the people, and you know how to toast the woman. How did you do it? Ah, uh, that one is different. How? Well, I lied. Okay, that's fine. But the point is. This is God's will for every believer. And don't let anyone twist this. Is that clear? Don't let anyone twist this one and say, well, it depends on the context. Oh, what context? Someone told me he was talking to the apostles. I said, so which one of them got you born again? Well, not directly. How? Which one of them got you saved? And how old are you, by the way? So this is God's mission for every believer. So you don't start out asking God... What his will is, no. You ask God, this is your will for all believers. How do I take my place in it? That's the question. It's not, Lord, what's your will? Lord, what's your will? If you have God's will and you ask for God's will, you are going to get what is not God's will in your prayer. Because when you have light and you're looking for light, you're going to walk into darkness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Remember, <laughs> someone telling me this. He said, I had to just pray. I prayed. I prayed. I prayed. I prayed. And I said, as you keep praying, you're going to hear voices. And those voices will not be from God. I prayed. You prayed about something that's so clear in God's word. He said, I know. But are there no special cases? Yours is one. So you, this is the will of God. So we're talking about sanctified common sense. You should see this clearly as the will of God for your life. Praise the Lord. If you walk into any local church, anywhere in the world, no matter their number, and this is not said to you as the will of God for your life, that local church is not the will of God for your life. Let me say that again. If you walk into any local church, and they don't tell you this is the will of God for your life, that local church is not the will of God for your life. So that's why they don't know. This is the will of God for your life. Doesn't matter your career, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter where you are, this is the will of God for your life. So in line what we're talking about, because we're going to get there, you need to renew your mind and sanctify your common sense. So you don't pray the wrong prayers. You don't have to ask God you know, to know a local church. I once tried to get a local church to attend on a Sunday morning. And I said, I had this period. I had, okay, let me get to see this church. So I, I got in there. And they asked me to put down my prayer points. Okay. I got there and I wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and the man said, I didn't ask you to write memory verses. Don't you have problems in your life? Now, I don't, ha- I don't need to pray about that. I could have stayed there. So I say, I know that they got it wrong. But I just have this leading in my spirit. There's something you like there. Many reasons. The ambience, location is close to where you are, network for business, or a woman you are chasing, or a man that is chasing you. Or the music. Because it's clear in God's word what your choices should look like. Are you there? All right, good. I'm preaching the gospel. Come down there shortly. Luke 24 and 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Not, not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory, begin at Moses and the prophets, he expounded them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And we said that this 
shows us without doubt that the Bible of Jesus is Genesis through to Malachi. And what does he do here? I'm going to say this for emphasis. Jesus does not change the meaning of texts in the Old Testament. Jesus simply showed the meaning. He didn't change the meaning. He didn't say, now, um, the menu here is a scientific word. It's not a spiritual word. It's something that is done in the scientific world, which means he simply found the meaning of the text. That was what he did. He didn't try to say, well, uh, what the Spirit is saying to me right now is that even though Moses said this or Jeremiah said this, but the Spirit is saying something else. That's not what he did. He simply found the meaning. And every Bible preacher and teacher is an interpreter of Bible text. That's your job. That's your duty. 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened he the, look at the focus again, law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened in their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Okay? Now look at verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus is written, and thus be of Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name of all God nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The emphasis is there again, preached in his name. So every child of God is a preacher. Say, I'm a preacher. Oh, I don't hear, I didn't hear you all. Say, I'm a preacher. You are born. Again, a preacher. You know, you say, I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm righteous of God in Christ Jesus. I'm a saint. I'm sanctified. One of your names in Christ is that you are a preacher. So I say, but I've not been preaching. That means you have been sinning. Can I have an amen? amen. Oh, you didn't say that so loud. Can I have an amen? amen? We have been sinning. Because the word of God says to preach. You are not preaching. You know, Imagine those who talk about sin and they forget this part. Let me ask you, uh, uh, do you preach the gospel? Um, I'm looking for the boldness. Looking for the boldness. To do what? To preach. I'm looking for the, the opportunity. What's your opportunity? Right? You know, you're disobeying God's word. That's what you're doing. John 20, 21, then he said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you, as my father has sent me, even so send are you. And when they said this, he breathed on them, them side sides there, and said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins you retain, or remain, re re sorry, that's the second time I'll start with retain. What have I been listening to? <laughs> whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. So we see, God gave us his spirit, so we can carry out his work on us. You know, you can ask, why did God give me his spirit? Well, he gave me his spirit so I can be better in school. Well, you lie, because you don't have Nobel Prize. God gave me his spirit so that I can be beautiful. Beauty is in the eyes of the old, I agree with you. God gave me his spirit so that I can do what? God didn't give you his spirit to fulfill your desires. He gave you his spirit to fulfill his own desires. Like that song says, you gave us your spirit... To reach the world. But our living right is for that purpose. A good character, a good conduct. Your good conduct is not to be saved, right? Right? Come on. Your good conduct is ministry. Your good conduct doesn't save anybody. Your good conduct is for ministry. It's not for, yeah, it's for God because you minister on his behalf. But it's not to be accepted. By God, no, you're already done. That's Ephesians 1 6, so you're accepting the beloved. And this is not just a New Testament mystery. No, that's exactly how it had been in the, in, in, in the books of Scripture. You will see in glaring, in open glare or glaringly, how every man that God had put his spirit upon was just human. Very human. So it wasn't a qualification, right? But the good conduct is for the sake of this global intense work of the spirit. So last week we looked at the Mark 16 fact, preach the gospel. We said the word is the basar. Remember that? 
Come on, remember that? Which we said, particularly in the Isaiah text, has to do with bearing the news of the kingdom. And we looked at three locations for kingdom. Remember? Come on. Come on now. Zion, where else? Let me see what I remember. Zion, where? Amagedon. Right, let's go. Zion, Jerusalem, and Judah in the Isaiah text. So what is God's kingdom? God's kingdom is where he is king and he is leading. So we're born, so to be born into God's kingdom means to be born into the leading of God. John 3, 3, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 5, except a man is born of water, which refers to the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And what that? What's that? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not I say to you, verse 7, you must be born again. Verse 8 of John 3, the wind blows where it leaves. He says you can hear the sound. You can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So we can say the kingdom of God is the leading of the Spirit. Say so with me, the kingdom of God is the leading of the Spirit. All right, good. So God is king. And by his spirit, he's leading us into his purpose and plan. So we entered into God's kingdom, simply means we got into his leading. And last week we looked at that word in Romans 8, 14. As many as are led by the spirit of God. We said the word ago in Greek is the word lagach. L-A-Q-A-C-H. To take up. Or the word NASA, N-A-S-A, to lift up. Or the word in Genesis 1-2, to carry. Rakaf, which we saw in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 11. So God takes us up, lifts us, and then he bears us by his spirit. To what intent? Romans 8-17, we are joined in. With Christ. So clear on us. We saw that last week. And I showed you that the word heir had been used in Romans 4 13 and 14 for Abraham. Galatians 3 29, Galatians 4 7, Hebrews 6 17, Hebrews 11 7, and James 2 5. God leads us into his own plan. So let's listen carefully now. The leading of the Spirit of God is for his own plan. So what he's leading us into is his own plan, his own purpose, and his own plan. So we saw a bit of that last week, that the bazaar where we bear the gospel. And we said that preaching the gospel is only for sinners. Is that what we said? Huh? No. The gospel is not just come and be saved. It refers to the activities of the kingdom of God. What I'm doing this evening is preaching the gospel. To tell you what is going on in God's kingdom is preaching the gospel. Now let's get to some specifics now. We saw that in the leading of the spirit, we're going to the book of Acts. Let's quickly look at it. Acts of the apostles. We see... With the written word, the spirit of God in the kingdom of God leads in specific instances. In Acts 9, before we get in there, Acts 9, right? I'll give you three things before that, two things will go. Acts 6 first, before we go to Acts 9, where we saw... There was a problem in the church. People felt that the widows were neglected. And the twelve called them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and Sabbath. We're going to come back to this. Look for among you seven men of 
Look here out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, I will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Which means, here we see the leading of the Spirit. Without necessarily being said, the Spirit of God said. Now we see in Acts chapter 8, upon the killing of Stephen, verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And we found Philip. That again is a leading of the Spirit by taking spiritual initiatives. By taking spiritual initiatives, we follow the leading of the Spirit. Acts 9, so as I was going earlier on, we found a vision where Jesus appeared to Ananias to go and lay hands on Saul of Tarsus. So we find revelation of the Spirit of God that is about individuals. Acts 10, uh, Peter had a vision. He went to pray about the sixth hour in verse 9. He became hungry, fell into a trance, verse 10. And then he was sent to the house of Cornelius. Acts 13, Acts 13, the Holy Ghost said in verse 2, after the administered the Lord and fasted, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherewith I have called them. So this, now we have the written word, which is general to all believers. Now we have instances where the Spirit of God makes all of us find our place, right, in that will of God. Are you learning something? You learning something? Acts 6. They found their place in the will of God. Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus found his place in the will of God. Acts 13, Saul and Barnabas found their place in the will of God. Now look at Acts 16. In the case of Acts 16, Paul and his team wanted to go to Asia. In verse 6, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. They came to Mysia, verse 7. They are said to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit didn't allow them to go. Eventually, they saw in a vision a man of Macedonia that prayed him, saying, come over unto Macedonia and help us. So we have specifics. So when it comes to the will of God, I will know whether what I have as specific is the will of God or not by knowing and obeying what is written as God's will. So where we find revelation, which is personal, direction, which are to the individuals, is still in the will of God. So what's going on here? They are finding their place in the will of God. Are they finding the will of God or they are placing the will of God? Come on now. Come on. So the written word already shows me the will of God. I know I should not be on equal yoke with an unbeliever. And do not dress an unbeliever as a believer. Amen. Come on now. Come on. I've seen people bring their intended candidates or aspirants, depending on whether the guy has gone for primaries or not, and bring them to church. And they say, he was around. <laughs> she came. For what? And she came to the church. Amen. I, I gave him some tapes. That's not the answer. Is he born again? I believe so. Ah. How can you say you believe somebody is saved? You believe? You are using your faith. No, don't do that. So unequally yoked, you already know that. Or a brother or a sister who is only in Christ in the book of life. Even angels are saying, not sure. Do you know him? I'm not sure. Demons even say, I'm not sure where he is. He's been around here for, for, for a while. He's not been here for a while. No, you came around yesterday. Oh, okay. And they're not sure. You say, I believe. And the Bible says, no, you avoid that. So you already know that. But you can now find your place in the will of God, which is marrying the Lord. You can now find your place. 
in the will of God. But you already know the will of God. I said that in the earlier series. Someone says, I don't believe in church. I'm born, I've been born again since the 70s. But I broke I do not believe in the in that legalism or formality called church. I believe church is in my heart. You say, how many nations are there? I believe a man can know God by himself. You are hearing that already. Not prophecy. Fulfillment. And you say, well, I believe. Uh-uh. Don't go and find God's, your place in that will. That's not what I'm talking about. There's no prayer point yet. You find your place in the will of God that is revealed in scripture. This is what's going on here. Acts 18. Are you in church? Acts 18 for Acts 17 first. And verse 16. Paul had this experience. His spirit was provoked in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. His spirit was stirred within him. Again to fulfill God's will. Acts 18. Acts 18. And verse 5. Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews. You see, it's about God's will that we had read earlier on. Acts 20 and 22. Acts 20 and 22. Now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city that's, that's saying that bonds and afflictions about me. You see that all through the book of Acts. So we have that, the inward witness. Pay attention. What is the inward witness? I need you to put this, again, I know I saw it last week. The inward witness is the witness of the human spirit born again. Right? I've been using this definition, I think, for 26 years. The inward witness is a witness of the human spirit born again, which has the life of God in it. And that spirit agrees to, disregards, acknowledges, refutes, a fact that is exposed to it. So I said last week, you have to first of all expose it to it. Now, see sometimes you're passing through the airport and then you 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 have stuff like uh, you, you put something in your bag, maybe water or something. I didn't even know the one like I had water in my bag. And he said, no, there's something in your bag. Ah, I said, my bag? I said, no, my bag. I said, no, there's something in your bag. But I had forgotten. The woman said, no, you have water in your bag. I said, oh, 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 we have put water in there. So I took the water out. He said, you drink it or you throw it away. I said, how can I drink this whole thing? Come on, you take it and throw it away. But it was a fact that the only reason why they saw it was because it passed through a scanner. Now, if I had taken that bag away from the scanner, it would never have said anything about the water. The scanner would remain there. The water would have gone beside it. And I would have drank my water across the river. You know what I mean by that? And at times like that, they say, okay, no worries. You can, you can don't, you know, take off your, 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 maybe your wristwatch and just pass through. You go, ah, say, is this your wristwatch? Just go. Ah, because you passed through a scanner. Now, if you didn't pass through that scanner, you can't say, how come the scanner did not detect it from where? You ran away like this, the scanner is here. How come, how, how come I did not know? Know what? He didn't pass through the scanner. You never expose this fact to your spirit. You didn't. But I was saying it. I was saying it. I know. But you never considered what was in your spirit about it. There are simple ways to do that. Learn that from Kenneth Hagin and E.W. Kenyon, of course, it's the whole counsel of God's word. Number one, when you meditate on God's word on an issue, what are you doing? You are checking in your spirit. You put the word of God in, in, on your mind. Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of the law shall depart from your mouth. You meditate day, day and night and observe to do all that you're in. Then you make your way prosperous and have good success. Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is a man that 
walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sin, nor sin, the sin of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the first thing. In this law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaves shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. Bring forth fruit in the season, sorry. Whatever he does shall prosper. So you go to meditate. You put the word of God on your mind about, about, about maybe you want to travel. Because, you know, that's all, what's in vogue now. And I've told you before, and I'm not saying this out of uh, fear, but when you see something that just becomes popular as a believer, naturally, you draw back. Ephesians 2, 1 says that, you know, you, uh, 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 verse, verse 1 and 2, tells us that we, either told before now, walked according to the course of the world, this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walks in the children of disobedience. Among whom we all are the constant time pass, through the of our flesh and mind, flesh and mind, and we are by nature children of wrath as others. Which means that I must watch what is trending as a believer. So you say, everybody, so everybody, so come on, let's travel, yeah, let's go, let's go, you know, let's move out of the country, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this one. And you just chose that you not go pray about it. Or you think about God's word, God, yeah, I'm just thinking. I'm led by the Spirit of God on this matter. And then you, you meditate on God's word, on it. Then you begin to speak God's word. Begin to speak God's word. You put God's word on your mouth. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word and deed, words do also the glory of God your words give direction to your mind so you begin to say no I'm not doing this of my own will or accord and some of us make the mistake we say well I'm praying about it so we surround ourselves with people that scorn God's word they say forget all that you read everything you I told you you know when I wanted to run out of Nigeria I told the story last week can you remember Cotton University of Technology? You remember, uh, uh, you remember things like that. I know some of you have gone to browse it. <laughs> I know you. You are going to check Cotton, Cotton. What's in that thing? I wanted to take my pastor away. Chill <laughs> <laughs> You get it. There's a time like that too. I tried to go do my law school abroad. I'd written some tests. Had made up my mind. You know, when you make up your mind on something, you know what I'm saying? I told you about 15 years. Huh? I told you, can I take it? Ah, I don't forget now. You don't make up your mind. You see? Lord, I know you love me. Um, uh, see the way you love me. You got in my matter for I know I don't know the song very well. <laughs> Say Lord, no matter what. Then begin to convince yourself. Um na, 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 reckless. So you've gone reckless. <laughs> I can't deny it. I can't uh, 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 four for ninety-nine. Uh, <laughs> no matter what it is, someone told me, he said, the way I know, I know that whatever I do, God has a plan for me. I said, ah oh, hey. <laughs> you are now but that God. <laughs> Brad God. <laughs> no, uh, you, uh, you know, you have to begin to convince yourself. But have you meditated on the word of God, spoken the word of God about it? Hallelujah. Have you put the word of God first place on the matter? I put the word of God above this one. I put the word of God above this one. And whenever you're doing that, when you get to church, it was as though the pastor had known what was on your heart. And he would just speak the right things. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm led by the Spirit of God. So you must expose your mind to the word of God on that issue. Hallelujah. Told you a lady like that. She told me this is guy. She she was really in love with the guy. The nineties. 
Then they would come to church and fellowship. So she told me that she just became uncomfortable. I said, why? I said, I don't know why. I just dipped down my spirit. I knew something was wrong. That every time they come to service and they're hearing God's word, she knows, she looks at them and sees something strange. So I said, well, I don't know what you're saying. I don't have, I, 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 I kind of like the guy. I'm not sure why, but I, I don't think he gave an offering. No. I waited for you to react, you know. But, and she said, she just, I said, okay, I'll give it some weeks and spend some time praying. And whatever the problem was, she found out. She found out. And I said, well, uh, you didn't find out not to marry the guy. You found out to take a, a decision. She said, ah, no, no. I said, relax. Don't be in a hurry again. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of us are too emotional to be led. <laughs> I didn't know. Clean your face. Who's making you cry? So you put the word first place and instantly obey. Now, actually, the, the way to put it is that you put the word first place, meditate upon the word, confess God's word, and instantly obey the voice of the Spirit. So you must expose the information to your heart. That's where the Holy Ghost is, right? That's where the light of the word is. So the leadings of the, the inward witness is a witness of the human spirit born again, which endorses, refutes, acknowledges, disagrees with the fact that is exposed to it. You must expose it. And one of the ways we also expose the fact to the spirit of God is talking to people who have good counsel. Now, do not, let me mention this. Don't go to your pastor. I know that we all are led by the Spirit, but don't go to your pastor or someone that should cancel you and say, Sir, I was praying, I'm led by the Spirit. Don't say things like that. I remember how I was taught to say it as a younger Christian. Sir, it seems as though, that's how to talk, it seems as though I'm getting an impression uh, about this. It seems as though. Or I feel like I am, you know, that's how the top boy say, God spoke to me. And then you come to me. <laughs> After God has spoke. <laughs> you choke. <laughs> he choke, he spoke. I can't say anything anymore. Amen. Praise the Lord. And some people can be, in fact, uh, some of you go, they want to talk about our relationship. I know how it's been done over the years. They start to talk about a disciple first. There's serious condition in their family. That's the other priority. They say, lastly, sir. I will say, get to the real issue. We disciple has bothered you like this. And actually, I was just, uh, that's all told me God said this. I said, oh. God already spoke to you. Okay. He said, I just, I just want to know how you feel. Ah. <laughs> you want to know how I feel about what God said? Ah. Tell God I'm lawyer. <laughs> I know. A wise thing is to say, I said, I just sense this. But I'm, and, then, and then let's pray about it. Every time, see, not every time. But many times when I ask you to go and pray, they come back with what was in their mind before they prayed. I said, ah, but this was what you had in your mind. I said, sir, I don't know. <laughs> I just, <laughs> you see, he just kept coming back. You know why? Because they got, they still got engrossed in all the activities they were doing before they came to you. So their mind will be full of the same things. Before you know it, Satan will arrange things for you. You just enter one Holy Ghost meeting. The person, Jejeli, is talking to somebody else. I said, that, don't be bold about that decision, says the Lord. If I've spoken to you, hasten and do it now. Yeah. Woo! Glory! And it's for somebody else to decide. Who knows? He said, 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ah, I was so blessed in this sense. Why? God said I should do it now. <laughs> There's all who told me that. He saw a woman. They were married in, in a picture. Wedding back, gown, gown and all that. He said, but, and I, I told her what God said. And she gave him no. So what do I do? Well, you have obeyed God. <laughs> she has disobeyed God. Right? So you ask God, lead me to somebody who is going to obey you. <laughs> you didn't get that. Right? Keep praying, keep praying. Say, hey, that's all, that's all. Well, for example, people came in Nigeria and said, God told them to be president. And I knew that. <laughs> you cannot be president. Maybe you should go and ask, of what? <laughs> no, really. There is, for example, this alumni president. There's a Christian Association of Nigeria's president. There's even street president. Nigeria's president. <laughs> <laughs> well, the consolation is, <laughs> and I've seen people say that God sent Moses to Egypt and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> Are you there? Someone told me, he said, yeah, He just has this leading, this leading. To where? <laughs> he mentions Canada. There's no leading to Canada. <laughs> Canada is comforting. Nobody needs the spirit <laughs> to go to Canada. Stop. Don't, don't bamboozle me. Just say, Pastor, I like Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk about it. He said, yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> hey, hey. Who's there is in my heart? Ah. You don't need a vision to carry. It's the newspapers. It's everywhere. How can you be a leading to go to where everybody is going to? Are you in church? <laughs> so you have lean up spirit. So you have to expose it to your spirit. You also have visions. Visions too require the same test. Interesting. Whether an angel spoke, just like Paul in Acts 27, who found Philip also was led in Acts 8. So you're going to be led by the Spirit, right? The inward witness, the audible voice, amen? Visions and revelations, praise the Lord. We taught you that, right? Amen, prophecies. You're going to be led by the Spirit of God. Different areas of your life. Don't forget, to fulfill God's will and you'll find out your place in His will. So a very simple test is I will run all my decisions through the test of the written word of God. The written word of God. I, I told someone, I said, I don't need to be told that you are going out of God's will. But I said, oh, how do I know? I said, it's simple. You have never engaged me. You've taken all your decisions. You had nothing in your mind about the great commission. I said, eh. I didn't know that one had to think about the great commission before he takes decisions. I said, you were a pastor. You were a pastor. How would you say that kind of nonsense? You think the work of the ministry is internship? Say, I used to be, or IT, I was, or NYLC. One year compulsory service to the ministry. One year compulsory. So they are to say, after one year, I go to the place of my primary assignment where I really want to go in my life. No. It's a lifetime engagement. Hallelujah. You there? It's a lifetime engagement. Praise the Lord. And you know, you have people who say, well, he's my age. Earlier today, we had the funeral ceremony of my father-in-law, Pastor Lass' wife. I was also sorry, Pastor Lass' dad. And, you know, you need to hear things like that. That a man at 80, when I wrote his tribute, I said he was 80 and attending prayer meetings. 80, going for evangelism. When he was in his 70s, he would take a stroll. I was praying in tongues. 
Praise the Lord. When he followed his wife to Benway State to go and the, he had retired, the wife had gone uh, to posted by the Ministry of Education to be the principal of Government College Book, Federal Government College Book. They went there and planted churches. It's so simple. Praise the Lord. So simple. And I said, this is really the issue for all of us. I was telling our pastors when we leave there, I said, when you see that kind of testimony, and they said that he was part of a 24-hour prayer, prayer group, he never missed his own hour. There are brethren here. Your age is not up to a quarter. You was... No. That's the will of God. What is it not making you do simple things like that? That's the will of God. And when they say the man is a man of God, everybody says a man of God. He led me to Christ. He taught me foundation school. What else is left in life? That's it. That is the will of God. How can a Christian pass on? And all we hear is that, ah, he was very jovial on the streets. Ah, Christian. He said, ah, the man can dress. Ah, he's a spoot. You know, I don't know what anyone calls spoots to spoot. Ah, that man can do. Indira Gandhi, Moshuti, Rashidi. Ah, Christian. Hallelujah. What an honor to know a man like that. Praise the Lord. 80 years old. Serving Christ. 80 years old. Going for prayer meetings. We're told in the church. He said, he never came late for church. 7 a.m. is in the service. 7 a.m. Never comes late for church. Those are things you hear as a Christian. You see, that's the will of God. And you know, God does this. When you hear stories like that, God is talking to you. Hallelujah. He's talking to you. You don't say, wow! Ah, uh ah! -uh. That's a good example of a Christian. Oh yeah, follow it though. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Praying two hours a day. Two hours. To pray two hours every day. Some of us here, we are in your 30s or early 40s or in the middle. You'll be struggling. Struggling. That's all. But is this thing compulsory? No, it, it's optional. Yeah, it's optional. It's not a compulsory, it's an elective. It's elective. Don't pray again. Thank you. This is the real man of God. No. You have things like that. It motivates you to stay in the will of God. Hallelujah. So you expose these things to your spirit. And so we said, you've heard the leading of God's spirit. You know what it is. You expose it to your spirit. You will witness, attest to it. And it's good sometimes when you're in a hurry to make plans. So of us, we plan so well. 14th, this one, 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 this one. Particularly when it comes to natural things. Never be in a hurry. Natural things. Things that naturally requires just common sense. Never be in a hurry. Just take some time, right? Pray in tongues. Put it in your, uh, put it in the, in, in the scanner, right? Come on. Come on now. And find out what comes out of it. So God wants us, right, to renew our minds. Or let me put that list, to sanctify your mind. The word sanctify, which is the word agios. You see it all over New Testament scriptures. In John 17, are you in church? John 17. And verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Now in John 15, 3, he says, you are clean by the words that I spoke unto you. You are clean. You are clean. First Peter 1, 22, 
First Peter 1 22 says your mind is purified. He has purified you, your souls, by obeying the truth. Through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Say, my mind is purified. Say, my life is purified. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So God has given you sanctification even in your mind. Now, what does sanctification mean? It means for God to set it apart. Which means, when we say sanctified common sense, God wants you to use your mind in line with his word. But don't forget, he wants you to use your mind. He wants you to use your mind in line with his word. And use your mind differently. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 6, 11 says, Such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So what do I do? I use my mind differently. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable worship. Then verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove that which is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So you have to use your mind in a different way. You have to work on your imagination. Because if you don't control your thoughts, right, you will lose sight of God's leading. If you're such a person that your thoughts can just go wayward. The moment you, and you know, we are all a product of influence. I've told you that before over and over and over again. I said that in the series we just concluded on Sunday. Do not overrate yourself. I mentioned Solomon. Solomon was a man who built a temple for God. And he said, Lord, let your name be on this house forever. And he, saw, he, he said, I'm not going to. He didn't ask for life. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for riches. And the, the angel said, you didn't even ask for what everybody's going to ask for. We would ask for. Therefore, you, you will have riches and wealth. And he had all the wealth. He had the wisdom. But you know what? Solomon had the wisdom of God. But wrong company changed it. He had the wisdom of God. He had revelation knowledge. He had insight into the word. But wrong company was all that he needed to change course. First Kings 11 one says he began to love strange women. There's nothing wrong in loving a woman, but strange. That means his mind was being used wrongly. Affection is humanity. Liking things is humanity. You can like things. It's humanity. You can want a better job. You should want a better job. If they're offering you five million somewhere, someone was asking me, they gave her, they, she was working somewhere for 400,000. They are now offering her about three million or two point something million. Should I take it? I said, what kind of question is that? <laughs> I, I don't understand that kind of question. 400,000, 2.5. Ah, in this day and age. That's simple mathematics. Remove 400 from 2.5, it's 2.1. <laughs> That's the answer. Now, that's just what it is. Now, for example, it could be that you now sat back and said, hmm, this might become this for me. Aha. Uh-huh. Oh, this might become an hindrance for me. Aha. Uh-huh. You know, and you sit back and say, even though logically this is the right decision, but I foresee this. It doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. But I should ask myself, how does this fit into God's will? There's nothing wrong in taking decisions to be better financially. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul, watch this, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 21. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 21, now, I mentioned a bit of that last week uh, during the services, in, and he says, um, well, he was talking about the widows, the unmarried, the married, and he says, look, 1 Corinthians 7, 20, let every man abide in the same calling where he was called. 
Uh, thou being called a servant, that means you're an employee, a born servant, you know, working for money, I mean, I mean, your services, I mean, rendered. You are the Lord's free man. No, no, sorry. Care not for it, sorry. That's 21. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. Now, it means if you have opportunity, opportunity, pardon me, to be free, which means if you can discharge this obligation and not, you know, financially speaking, he says, use it. And Paul uses the Greek word, kraumai, in the Greek. C-H-R-A-O-M-A-I. It means to take advantage of something. So there's absolutely nothing wrong in you taking advantage of opportunity. In fact, there are some other versions that render it differently. And they talk about this same fact to use it well. The Berean Study Bible says, take the opportunity. Which means opportunity is just part of humanity. You see an opportunity, take it. It also includes relocating to another nation. It's an opportunity. The old man Christian Bible says, by all means, take the opportunity. By all means. Contemporary English version says, if you can win your freedom, you should. If you can win your freedom, you should. The Good News Translation says, if you have the chance to become free, use it. If you have the chance. Same as the Good World Translation. If you have the chance, use it. So opportunity is part of humanity. And you can use it. You use opportunity. However, see carefully now, Paul, in the same breath, 1 Corinthians 7, the same Greek word in verse 30. They that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passes away. Which means that there should be restraint even in your use of opportunities. You should use opportunities. If you find, if you, if you're, if you have an opening to do other business as a businessman, use it. An opening in another industry, of course, use it. But in using opportunities, right, always ensure that you are not abusing it. You use it properly. And a, a key component of it is to be led by the Spirit of God. There could be opportunities that will gain you wealth, name, fame, and status, and you'll get derailed, generally. And there will be opportunities that you will use, and they will advance your course in life as a preacher and a Christian. It goes both ways. It's just that you must ensure that you run the necessary checks, if need be. So you sit back and use your sanctified common sense. What does this mean? What does getting married mean? Having children, what does it mean to me? Don't just say, ah, everybody doing not how to do it. That doesn't make sense. What does leaving Lagos to go and live in Polakot, what does it mean? I told, I told someone, I said, sit back and look at the course of your decision. Use your sanctified common sense. You're dealing with, a, in the instances, guys, the God will necessarily tell you, it's evil, it's good. There's sometimes you, with God's leading, you know who you are. You know the things that you, you have. Paul said to Timothy, he said, prophecy has gone before on thee, for somebody one it in, with them you wage a good warfare. You already know that. The rest now, you have to use your sanctified common sense. When the angel said to Zechariah, you're going to have a child. And Zechariah, you know, he, he said, well, how can this be and all that? And then he, he, he couldn't speak for a season. You know, despite the fact that he couldn't speak for his season, he knew what to do with his wife. Amen? That's using your sanctified common. You, God won't tell you what to do. You sit back and think. You have God's leading already, yeah? 
You have prophecies already. You have God's leading already. So you begin to think, what does this mean to what I'm already led to do? You use that sanctified common sense. Your renewed mind becomes useful at this point. So which means, I sit back and say, okay, what does this imply? So I sat these folks down and I said, you know, if you're going to do this, you realize that this decision means you're going to change your local church. Not just that. You're going to change your sphere of influence. You are going to also change your environment. And they were even going to be within Nigeria. I said, it also means a couple of things is going to happen. Oh, that's true. We're just thinking. We said something very funny about Luke Hutch, and I said, you saw an opportunity, which is fine, but you have not used your sanctified common sense. What you just said now doesn't make sense. So I just think, I just thought that since they're living world media everywhere, I'll just be listening to it. And I'll watch you on television. So why didn't you walk on television? You know? And you know, there's this thing about technology you have to be careful for. And I said it in many fora last few weeks. That those who say I can sit at home and attend church are doing evil to you. Yes, we can use technology to read the isolated, those who are isolated naturally. But you cannot isolate believers using technology. How would you have church without commitment? No commitment. And the implications of it are dangerous. Dangerous. No commitment. You don't want to do anything at all. That is sacrificial, shows consecration and commitment. You just say, let me just, let it just be at the comfort of my, of my life. No, you can't do things like that. And Hebrews 10 warns you. He says, do, he said, not forsaking the assembling together when I ask the man or something, which means you can develop a habit. I told you before, Satan plays the long game. He's too experienced not to know how to deal with that kind of sacrifice. Don't be silly. Sit back. Look at the implications of what you're saying. And I said, sit down also. Look at the implications of what you're about to do. I even went beyond just church and ministry, went to different things, but I found out that they just didn't think through. Sit back and use your sanctified common sense. Part of that is that God, through experience, has already showed you certain things about your life. You know that already. There are things you don't have to have a voice about. You can see it already. Your experience has already showed you. And hindsight is better than foresight. Hindsight is better than foresight. You already know it. So you use your sanctified common sense. You sit down and think. And think through. Told you the story of my friend, or my former friend, still a friend, one way or the other, who went abroad and then changed the course of his life. And the lady, he was, uh, they were in a relationship about four years before then. She said, No, I can't go ahead. I said, Why? She said, No. He told me, right? What he told me when we met was that. He was going to be a preacher because he was already a preacher when I met him. And I asked him questions like he has a medical degree and uh, he has, uh, he told me basically that why he was going abroad was because God told him when he was in secondary school to take the word of God to the Arab nations. He said, that was what he told me. That's who I fell in love with. So I didn't get, I wasn't doing this for money, sir. I was looking at that girl and I was jumping for joy inside me. I didn't show it. So I just said, yes, I can do it. She so even told me you put me on a salary every month. I said, I don't need your money. That's rare, right? Oh, come on. I don't need your money. I wasn't talking about money. And the guy's outside with a brand new car. 
I mean a brand new car. That was a C-class uh, 2001 model. Outside. Just open the window and say, huh. see we love God. <laughs> and she said no. Because he told, told me to go and beg for him. I'm the mediator. After he shot me out for two and a half years, he didn't speak with me. Now, there was now a need. Now came to call me. From Ikorodu? He came to Dolphin Estate also, yeah. The lady was saying, when was praying, sir? She said, no. He told me he's a preacher. He's not a preacher now. So I said, what if he gets back? He said, no, it's not me. Ah. What if he restored me? He said, no, you should not do it because of me. I said, this is a tough one. But I said, you are good. <laughs> and I went to meet my friend in the car. He was, you know, he believed I had the magic words. He didn't know I went there with another purpose. I'm telling you. So he's going to the car and now play the song by Dom, I mean, uh, Bob, um, Ron Kinoli and Dallin Check. You are the love of my. I won't trade you. I said, Fred, you have to sing this song more these days. <laughs> this is a word from God. Say, ah, Prophet, I won't do this. I've told myself that this time I'm going to be committed. I said, yeah, you have to. You have to. So what did she say? I said, the way I see it, she, she will do the will of God. And you will like it. <laughs> you know, because it's very difficult these days. If you go and tell him what she said. You don't know what will happen next day. They will just love it themselves again and they will use you. I have enough experience not to say everything like that. So I said, don't worry, whatever she does, you will love it. It will be. She said, are you sure? So I said, I'm very sure. Just drop me. I said, no, just drop me at the junction of my just be going. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Boys took a smart decision. I know you said you're a preacher. That's what you said. That's why, I mean, that was the that was the manifesto. That's the campaign manifesto. That's how you what you do campaign. And I voted for you. You can't change it for me now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's sanctified common sense, right? Amen. Don't think anybody is your ticket to go abroad. For your visa. Now begin to go around church. For those who are born abroad. What's your name again? <laughs> Tokumbo. The real one? <laughs> wow. Wow. That's good. Yeah, you know, I, when I, I mean, they go and tell your pastor, I want to change my department. <laughs> I don't want to mention any department here. I don't want trouble, you know, but I say, ah, yeah. They're good. They're not thinking. They're not thinking. Praise the Lord. You have to use your mind purposefully. Don't be led by the Spirit this way. Allow your mind to go this way. Use your sanctified common sense. Sit down. This one does not require prayer. You already know the will of God. It doesn't require prayer. If you go and pray, you are looking for trouble. Use your sanctified common sense. Use your mind. I told you, life, humanity is about opportunities. You get opportunities. So was telling me, why did somebody leave his club for another club? Said, ah, what kind of question is that? They are paying him 80000 here. 250,000 there. He said, but, sir, what has happened to his career? His career has gone down. I don't ask the question. He said, be his skills. He's smart. If you had stayed in your club, earning 80,000, his skills would have still gone down. But he moved with opportunity. And he signed for four years, which means despite his skills, he's going to earn that money. Right? He said, yes. That is normal decision making. 80,000 is less than 250,000. Right? Both spiritually and physically. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
a brand new car, a better than a fairly used car. If you have old and new testament. <laughs> right? Is this decision? Not that they offer you a brand new car, say, ah, should I buy a brand new car? What's the what kind of question is that? Thank you. <laughs> Are you about to buy one the way you laughed? <laughs> Do you get it? A brand new phone, go. <laughs> it's better than fairly used. Right? Is it not true? Amen? Amen? And the house you move into without painting and bringing plumber. Amen? Those are just decisions you don't say, Lord, Lord. But watch your spirit. Those days when you're talking about it, and you put God's word on your mind, you find a reaction that is strange. Why is there a reaction? Find out. Okay? But you must take decisions that sanctify common sense. They gave you a job. The job will earn you times 10 of what you're earning right now. But that job takes you seven days a week. And you're a pastor. The guy told me this, and it's such a blessing. And uh, I was going to share something the other day. Uh, yeah, someone told me a story recently. I said I was going to tell the church. That was just yesterday. Oh, I can't remember the story now, because when I want to talk about this, now, I just remember that one that happened yesterday. So the guy told me, he said, sir, I had two job opportunities. One was going to earn me 1.8 million naira. One is 300,000. He said, but I didn't pray about it because you've already taught us that already. He said, I'm a pastor. The other one was going to take 1.8 million. I'll be gone for six weeks and come back and use two weeks and six weeks. I can't do that since I have the flock. He said, I took the one for 300,000, even though it's lesser, but I'm going to be with the flock. Wow, that's sanctified common sense. Don't get yourself tempted by saying, let me pray about it. Be asking around, what do you think? What do you think? You know how ask your siblings who are looking for money? Ah, Egon? Egon, you question about that one. Ah, Egon, what kind of question is that? <laughs> you ask me, you ask me, so brother, you ask, the brother will say, hmm, I understand the place of ministry. And so, but I'm just thinking, the pastor has told us, that sometimes professional trips can be an open door to the ministry. I think you just pray about it a bit. Uh, and just, uh, just, I mean, how are they causing like that? Who? And the guy is looking at you and saying, ah, 1.8. <laughs> I need my house friend. This guy can give me 400 k. <laughs> <laughs> are you in church there? Yeah? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. It's also good to ask the right people, right? Imagine you are thinking of a, a marital decision you want to ask your parents. What do you think they are going to say? You say, ah, praise the Lord, oh, thank God, oh. <laughs> so, mommy, so you pray about it. No, we are prayed. <laughs> amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> you put the word for space, amen. And then you follow the of the God's spirit in your heart. But sit down and think about this. Think about it well. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. Think about it. Well. And take the right decisions. Glory to God. Say glory to God. Say so I have a good mind. A, good mind. a sanctified, mind. sanctified mind. My mind, My mind. cannot be manipulated. Can be manipulated. By comfort. Or pain, or pain, or lost. Or lost. My mind is in the right place. Right. It's sanctified, sanctified by God's word, by God's word. and God's spirit. You know, that's what goes on. When we come to church like this, our mind gets renewed. We think differently. We just reason differently. Praise the Lord. And that's why, have you, have you discovered when you stay away from Christian fellowship after a while, a lot of things will not be on your mind. I've never done it before. I know those who have done it, they keep struggling. It just gets struggling. They, they, 
Our prayer lives, even though we have personal prayer lives, they are enhanced by other believers helping you to do it. That's what it is. So use your sanctified common sense. Sit down and think through what you're doing. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. We're not misled. And haste doesn't make sense to you. Don't be in a hurry. Ah! Don't be in a hurry. And for many of us who are social media friends, I am too. You, you got to watch out for undue pressure. Unnecessary pressure. Follow good examples, but don't be pressured into competition. Don't match anybody's records or what anybody has done with his or her life. Hallelujah. And I believe by the Spirit of God this evening, there's rest in your souls. Is that clear? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's rest. Contentment overwhelms you. Stand to your feet. Lift your hands and thank God for your life. Come on. Thank God for his leading in your life. Come on. Amen. Thank God. Thank God for his leading. Lift your hands. Come on. Fresh contentment in your life. This evening. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Come on. Fresh. Come on. And for those of you, and I just saw something a couple of minutes ago, keep standing. You've been born again over 10 years, at least 10 years. I'm praying specially for you tonight. Over 10 years being a Christian. You've been born again since the 2000s. And I pray for you that every form of pressure. I want you to remain standing actually. Remain standing. I purposely want you to stand. Every form of pressure is taken away from your life in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? For those of you who have been saved for at least 10 years or more, Satan cannot derail you. I say that as a servant of God tonight. That you will burn continually. I pray for you today. I say that into your life. The prophecies that came to you 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they are coming to pass in your life. And we take a stand against any form of distraction in your life because of money, because of fleshly desires, because of sex because of emotional pressure, because of family pressure, because of competition amongst friends. We remove it tonight. In the name of Jesus. You are not moved by sight. You are not moved by emotions. You are moved by God's word. I'm speaking specifically to those of you who have been born again at least 10 years. We rise above this world and the systems of this world. We rise above this world and the systems of this world. You do what you are doing now in peace. By the freedom of the Spirit of God, you do what you are doing now in peace. And you walk worthy of the Lord. Well, please. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you grow in more years in the Lord, you grow in leaps and bounds. You grow in leaps and bounds. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you grow in leaps and bounds. 
10 more years of success in the will of God. Or another 10 years of doing the right things. Tens and tens of years. You keep doing the right things. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are stronger to do God's will. You are healthier to do God's will. You are fulfilling and fulfilled in doing God's will. No student of yours will become a mark of judgment over your life. All who have followed you will keep following you. No one who have a reason to stop following you because you are no longer a good example. The last 10 years or more of your life is just the beginning. There are many more tens of years ahead of you. I'll bring forth fruit to abound in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 Lift your hands and bless you. Your spirit with 